Hello, everybody. It's my great pleasure to talk about invasive EEG um, monitoring today uh, for Wu Medi. Um, my name is Stefan Schüde. I'm a professor of neurology at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. I have a couple of disclosures. I, I'm on a couple of uh, speaker bureaus, also do some uh, consulting activity, and recently published a textbook on the practical approach to stereo EEG. Uh, I don't think that any of that will directly influence the content of this talk. I'm going to talk today about invasive EEG. I will give a brief historical background, then we'll dive into uh, stereo EEG, which is the predominant technology we use these days. Um, talk about uh, technology complications, patient selections, and then we'll uh, look at the how to define the epileptogenic zone so using stereo EEG on, on the basis of a, a patient. And we probably all remember the, the old days of epilepsy surgery when um, Penfield and Jasper performed electrocorticography in the OR and tailored their resections. Uh, patients did reasonably well, about 50% of them became seizure-free, but there was also a large number of patients who didn't get resected. And it became clear relatively quickly that, that it was actually important to record the seizures and also cover more mesial structures, um, because that's where seizures actually arose um, when they were stimulated. That led to a quest to actually leave these electrodes in. Um, which was successfully done in North America with subdural electrodes, um, which uh, with platinum material, which are now MI compatible. Um, but they up to today still require a relatively large craniotomy um, and uh, is are associated with a significant number of comorbidities and complications. At the same time, in France, at St. Anne in Paris, Talerach and Bonco try to. Uh, develop a technology using uh, stereotactic depth electrodes to really understand the three-dimensional propagation of uh, seizures in space and time. It was the pre-imaging area, so they tried to define the lesional zone using SEG and slow wave activity. And they also were uh, postulating that they can actually you know, physiologically with the stereo EG electrodes uh, determine the epileptogenic zone, the area which has to be removed to make the patient seizure-free um, ahead of the surgery. Um, with uh, stereo EG. Up to today, the technology has shortcomings in terms of functional mapping and delineation of eloquent cortex. Um, keep in mind, obviously, not everybody needs invasive monitoring, um, and that even uh, in invasive monitoring series, the majority of patients actually is lesional. So about 70 to 80% uh, actually have a lesion. But the findings may be discordant, or the lesion may have poorly defined borders, or the lesion may be so close to eloquent cortex that further uh, refinement is necessary, or patients may have several lesions or an unsuccessful prior surgery. Um, and then there are an increasing number of patients with non-lesional epilepsy, uh, which the majority of them really needs an invasive evaluation, maybe with the exception of patients who have non-dominant uh, temporal lobe epilepsy and uh, PET findings or other findings which clearly support um, the epileptogenic area. And keep in mind that based on large series, about 70% of epilepsy surgeries actually can nowadays be performed without an invasive EEG thanks to uh, the MRI. In favor of stereo EEG are obviously patients who are non-lesional, um, who have, uh, because the outcome with subdural grids was rather dismal in these patients, patients who have complex lesions, multiple lesions, surgical failure, deep lesions. Um, on the other hand, uh, many, Many of us still use subdural grids for patients who have uh, an epilepsy very close to eloquent cortex to be able to do um, um, cortical mapping and also to offer better uh, coverage of the lateral surface. And then there are patients uh, who may actually need both technologies, either a combination at the same time of depths and, and, and uh, grids, or patients who have serial evaluation with uh, stereo followed by subdural grids, which we've done a number of times, particularly in dominant temporal lobe epilepsies. Let's talk about uh, stereo EEG uh, in specifically. The technology was rather difficult to implement in the, in the early stages. You needed a, a large uh, angiography suite with a, a large distance of your uh, camera from the patient to have a non-distorted parallel x-rays to be able to superimpose the angiography on the patient's skull and that way to be able to place uh, orthogonal electrodes um, in, in Talarach space, avoiding blood vessels. Nowadays, these things can obviously be done with contrasted MRI or CT or digital angiography. Um, and uh, 
can be performed uh, via robot, allowing us not only orthogonal but also diagonal electrons. The, one of the um, major advantages for of stereo AG is the reduced mobility for the patients um, would feel quite well when they leave the OR, but obviously there's still a number of complications which have to be considered. One is that obviously stereo AG in these complex patients may not always be able to define the epileptogenic zone. So there are about 20% of patients where we do an invasive evaluation and don't, don't, don't pursue with resection ablation. Um, or we may be able to define the epileptogenic zone, but are unable to resect because of functional concerns. And then are the actual surgical complications. So patients may have hemorrhage, um, infection, hardware problems, or other issues uh, which occur. Um, uh, hemorrhages occur in the order of about 1% to 2%, with about 0.4% leading to permanent deficits. There was a recent paper that, uh, published by uh, uh, Birgit Fauscher and her group in JAMA, which actually uh, allows to predict the ability to find a focus um, on stere stereo EG uh, using the uh, uh, non-invasive EMU data. So the presence of an MRI lesion, regional scalp EEG onset absence of bilateral independent spikes, a strongly localizing semiology, and the localizing neuropsychological deficits all are positive predictive uh, factors to indicate that the stereo EEG evaluation is actually going to be successful. If you compare subdural grids and stereo AG, this is a paper published by Nit and Tandon about three years ago. If you compare the patients who undergo resection in his series, there clearly was a statistically significant benefit for patients with stereo AG in terms of seizure-free outcome or class one or two angle outcome. But if you look at um, actually the total number of patients evaluated, so including the significant number of patients who won't undergo resection, uh, the benefit actually goes away. So it's a, a little bit of a question about how you want to look at this. The other question which comes up is, uh, you know, these, these are obvious different patient population. You know, some of you know the patient we use subdurals are often different than the patient we use stereo EG, particularly if they're both available. That question was answered in a very elegant uh, study by Lara J just recently use the propensity score matching to actually balance out between these covariates between the different groups. And she found a similar result that as subdural evaluations have a higher chance that you actually will undergo up subsequently resective surgery. They have a, a significantly higher risk of complications. Um, and stereo EG has a higher odds of seizure freedom if you look at the patient who actually undergo resection. So lastly, we want to talk a little bit about how to use stereo EEG to define the epileptogenic zone. Um, so is this a fishing expedition? Are we just uh, distributing depth electrodes all over the brain? Um, you, you know, sim the stereo EEG can follow similar principles as has been established by Hans Luders uh, many years ago when we talked about the different uh, zones we can define in order to actually define the epileptogenic zone, that is irritative cortex, the seizure onset zone, the epileptogenic lesion, the symptomatogenic zone, functional deficit zone, and the eloquent cortex. All these areas really define, help us to plan a resection um, even in 3D space as we, as we are used to now with stereo EG um, to look at the lesion, the perilesional area, um, the symptomatogenic cortex, the area where the seizures spread, and also the area where we suspect eloquent cortex, um, which we can't resect. It is not a fishing expedition. This is just one, an example of our implantation schemes we use as a starting point for our patient implantation. You can see in the left upper corner our fairly standard uh, anterior temporal approach with one insular electrode, some orbital frontal coverage, and then mainly, mainly uh, coverage of the temporal tip and the hippocampus in the basal temporal region. Um, or you have a more extensive coverage of patients who have suspected temporal plus epilepsy, which need opercular coverage and uh, two diagonal insular electrodes. Or you're talking about patients who have uh, posterior temporal or temporal occipital lobe epilepsy, which need a more posterior coverage. So that I think is a good starting point. But at the same time, not every patient needs that kind of network exploration. Um, of a larger area. Some patients may actually have a very, very distinct a very focal epilepsy, which uh, we evaluate with the 3D grid approach. 
What I mean by that is, is this is a patient who has the abnormal um, transverse uh, sulcus splitting literally his primary motor cortex on the right side. And his seizures were clearly come from that area, at least what we could tell from surface EG. And instead of distributing electrodes very widely, we really knew this, this abnormal sulcus is what, what creates his epilepsy. So we placed um, six uh, depth electrodes, literally palisading this uh, two centimeter deep and two centimeter long um, transverse gy sulcus, um, and even placed uh, four um, subdural strips on top of it to do better functional mapping. Unfortunately, he ended up um, having a, a non-resectable uh, uh, focus and uh, 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 agreed to have a uh, responsive neurostimulator placed. We do respiratory monitoring in our center for uh, with our invasive uh, electrodes. Um, and that I, I think is extremely important because a large number of patients, as you can see here, the very first clinical sign before you see um, anything um, objectively at the bedside is actually apnea, which is often easier to detect than ictal tachycardia, which is probably more common, but often a gradual process. So you can really see in, in after, four, after about 10 seconds in this 30 second page that the patient has an abrupt cessation of airflow. Um, and that corresponds with the um, amygdala involvement, electrode A and J, which is the temporal tip. Um, and then uh, subsequently, you actually get the involvement of the hippocampus. Um, so that can be extremely important to correlate truly really, um, clinical onset and EEG onset and to make sure that you're actually seeing something on the EEG before you're seeing um, something clinically. You know, when we, when we look at uh, stereo EEG, we, we emphasize much more uh, information which gives us three-dimensional um, uh, ideas and information. So we, we are heavily relying on um, uh, uh, morphometry on MRI and uh, relaxometry and uh, additional processing of MRI findings to find these subtle lesions um, to cover them adequately, particularly bottom of the sulcus for crococortical dysplasias. Um, we rely heavily on patients who have nuclear imaging studies, PET and SPECT, because they're often non-lesional cases. We do, many centers have access to at least some form of uh, source imaging, either magnetic or electric source imaging. Um, and we, uh, almost all of our patients get functional MI before surgery to make sure, because it's many of these uh, patients actually, um, we need functional MI to substitute some of the cortical mapping we could have done with subdural grids, but also because we're often talking about people lesion and uh, the risk of cortical, of functional deficits is often more related to disconnections than uh, cortical resections. I wanna go briefly over a case to kind of sum this all up. Um, this is a 31 year old gentleman who had uh, onset of epilepsy a few days after he got assaulted and uh, punched from behind. Um, he has seizures starting with an rising, uh, with an episodic deja vu sensation and lightheadedness and whole body tingling, so a little bit of a neocortical and mesial temporal aura, uh, which then progresses to unresponsiveness and convulsions, and he had failed a number of medications. Um, this is our simulogic summary, so he has a psychic aura, um, followed by automotor seizures, and when we recorded him, he had a right head version and followed by a generalized convulsion, so indicating a left hemisphere onset. He had left anterior temporal sharp waves on surface EEG. He had uh, a nice uh, temporal delta uh, activity right at onset um, in the seizure. We did uh, ESI uh, in indicating uh, on dipole as well as uh, uh, current density modeling that his uh, mesial temporal lobe was involved. We did some additional MRI analysis. Uh, showing that there was some questionable increased signal of his left mesial temporal uh, structures, but no atrophy on morphometric um, analysis. Uh, so indicating there may be a potential lesion. He had pre-existing uh, uh, verbal uh, fluency uh, issues, as well as memory issues and in encoding and retrieval, indicating that his left uh, dominant temporal lobe was probably in, in indicated. Um, and uh, he had a relatively slam dunk case, everything indicating that he probably has left temporal lobe epilepsy, um, except for that he had not, didn't have a cl clear lesion. Um, so why would we do invasive evaluation in a patient like this? Well, um, I think it, it, one thing is that we also we were planning a more selective uh, uh, 
procedure. We, the patient was interested in laser ablation. So we definitely wanted to make sure that we understood that he has mesial temporal lobe epilepsy rather than neocortical or other sub subtemporal temporal subtypes or even pseudo temporal lobe epilepsy. In patients with dominant temporal lobe epilepsy, epilepsy we also want to be 100% sure that we, um, he does have temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, so our primary hypothesis was he has most likely mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, but we wanted to explore any other options as well. Um, we, this is our fairly standard approach. We had two insular electrodes, in, in, particularly because he had this uh, whole body tingling sensation, which can sometimes be an opercular phenomenon, as well as some lightheadedness and dizziness, in addition to the deja vu uh, or um, we covered the temporal lobe the insula, the orbital frontal cortex. He had uh, repetitive sharp waves over the electrode D1, his anterior hippocampal electrode. He had seizure onset also with a very good pattern with repetitive spikes followed by uh, DC shift and low amplitude uh, fast activity um, over the same electrode. Um, we were able to um, induce his habitual seizures with uh, uh, low frequency stimulation over contact D23 over the um, hippo hippocampus, um, causing the same clinical symptoms and also very similar propagation pattern as we've seen before in his habitual seizures or spontaneous seizures. We did um, more let wave transform similar to what has been done by Krenenko and Pat Patrick Chauvel in a brain paper, which they called the epileptogenic fingerprint where they could demonstrate that the seizure onset is often in these patients associated with these um, two lines of um, kind of high frequency activity and a dropout of uh, power of uh, low frequency activities in the areas of ictal onset. Um, so I think that, that kind of digital anal cognitive analysis of your uh, seizure pattern can give you some additional information which may otherwise not be uh, visual. Um, so the patient had to make a decision between given the fact that he had several risk factors for memory decline, it's his dominant hemisphere, um, he doesn't have a clear cut atrophy. Um, he had actually on a better right sided uh, verbal memory um, than left side, uh, better right sided memory than left sided memory and VADA testing. But on the other hand, he had a pre existing deficit and he really wanted to become seizure free and uh, took the risk of, um, of the procedure. And actually, his wife just uh, texted me, the, uh, sent me an email the other day after him being seizure free for a year, thanking me that I gave his gave her, her husband back, which it's always very gratifying. gratifying. Um, so in summary, um, about 20 to 30 patients, uh, 30, 20 to 30 percent of patients who need uh, who undergo epilepsy surgery and undergo resection need an invasive evaluation. The majority of these patients uh, are still done on patients with lesional epilepsy. Um, we heavily rely on advanced imaging and improvement on non-invasive understanding of the, of the epileptogenic zone. Um, and uh, stereo EG has really shifted our cases to more complex cases. Um, we do a lot of multiple lesion, deeper lesions and non-lesional epilepsy here in Chicago. Um, and we obviously rely heavily on a good hypothesis and have uh, also the indication and, and procedure in mind we are planning to potentially offer. Um, particularly non-lesional cases really benefit from some ad advanced MRI analysis. Um, and I think it's also useful to do some digital uh, signal analysis to look for an epileptogenic fingerprint on um, which you otherwise cannot see visually. Um, yeah, thank you for your attention and I hope uh, you enjoyed my talk.